Okay, so welcome everyone to our Leadership Dialogues. Um, it's something we've been focusing on quite a lot over the last few months as we've been reimagining financial services for, for the future. We've been lucky enough to, to speak to quite a few uh, leaders in the industry on, on a number of different topics, such as reinvigorating payments, refreshing the customer journey, uh, and rethinking the ecosystem. Today we have uh, another hot topic, which is close to my heart, which is all around controls and surveillance, and thinking more broadly about how do some of the tools and systems help us to dynamically monitor employee behavior. Uh, I'm Nick Fulton. I'm a senior manager in our global markets practice uh, here at Beringa and delighted to be joined by Ross Aubrey today from Contexa. So Ross and I go back quite a way because we've actually helped implement surveillance systems at, at some of our mutual clients. So well, welcome Ross and uh, yeah, thank you very much for, for taking the time out today. I think before we dive into our conversation, Ross, what would be really good for our listeners is just to understand a little bit more about you and, and also Contexa. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Nick. So as you mentioned, I'm Ross Salbury. I'm the head of financial market solutions at Quantexa. Um, I've been with the company just over two and a half years now, which has, has been a huge period of growth and success for the company. Uh, prior to making the leap into the world of RegTech, most of my career was actually spent in banking, primarily in front office business management, supervision and surveillance roles, monitoring employee conduct and behaviour. So a little bit about Quantexa. We are a data analytics, sorry, data analytics company that delivers contextual decision intelligence. And contextual decision intelligence, or CDI, is a new approach to data that empowers organisations to make faster and more accurate operational decisions at scale. And our platform is being used to support a number of different data challenges and use cases, such as financial crime and surveillance. But it's also being used in a number of other industries outside of financial services, things like insurance, government and telecoms. We're headquartered in London, but we have offices and staff all over the globe to support our clients. I think we're, we're approaching 400 employees now. Wow. We uh, recently celebrated our fifth birthday earlier this year in March and also announced our Series D funding, bringing in $153 million to further build out the product and support our continued growth in all regions. Brilliant. Great, great to see that Contexa are getting that refreshed investment as well, Ross. Must be really exciting. Absolutely, it is indeed. Yeah. Okay, um, so I think before we get into the crux of our conversation, I think I'll just give some market context because I'm not sure all of our listeners are, are necessarily um, that close to the surveillance world. But I suppose what, what we're seeing in the market right now is that the, the traditional, the rules based, the parameterized systems are, are considered very much a, an old world approach from, from a client you know, compliance monitoring perspective. Yes, they're good at detecting risk at a single point in time using trading comms data. Um, but they're, they're failing to find some of the subtleties a bit around what you mentioned, context, relationships and, and some of the behaviours that are becoming much more important when we're detecting market abuse risk, financial crime, um, as well as misconduct. Um, and without the right tools in place, we're seeing that you know, banks end up, their teams are flooded with, with you know, high volume of alerts that are, tend to be low quality. They've got a very siloed way of, of managing risk. And we've seen false positives sometimes up at rates of, of 95%, which just means that their teams are essentially getting flooded with, with work that, that's wasted um, in essence. So that's just to give some, some context um, to our listeners. But I suppose based, based on some of these challenges, Ross, uh, you know, how, how can context help? Yes, yeah, sure. So I agree with all of those things you just mentioned, Nick. That, that's a good start. Um, and in terms of how context can help, um, at the heart of all of our solutions are the same core platform capabilities and those are entity resolution, network generation, advanced analytics and visualization. And entity, starting with entity resolution, that's the process that essentially creates that bigger picture. It helps to start to create that context. And it does that by bringing together data from internal and often disparate data sources and combines it with up to date external data to deliver the context to help create that single dynamic view. Because, of course, knowing and understanding who or what an entity is and how much risk they can present is absolutely critical to then ensure you apply the right level of monitoring. And in terms of what an entity might be, just to explain that a little bit further, an entity could be the bank's clients. It could be their high risk population employees, people like your traders and your salespeople. It can be the security or the financial instrument that's being traded by the institution. It can then actually be also the issuer of those securities, and that's been a very hot area of interest and focus from FINRA in the US at the moment, for example. 
But going even further, it can be the service provider of those issuers, so lawyers, auditors, transfer agents. And we've been successful at finding risk at all of those levels. And then for, for each of those entities I've just mentioned, we can also look at things like um, addresses, phone numbers, email addresses, etc. And then interestingly, what we can also do is treat the alert output from existing monitoring tools as entities as well. As you mentioned, one of the biggest challenges for many surveillance teams is high volumes of low quality alerts and false positives. But by leveraging Quantex's capabilities and using additional data to provide context, it can help with the triage of those alerts. We can that, that kind of additional context could actually be a mitigating factor, which could be used by the investigator to suppress or close a false positive much faster and with confidence. Or it might actually add additional risk weighting to say, well, hang on, this is actually higher risk and requires immediate attention. And what we're actually seeing a shift towards at the moment is a move towards entity centric reviews to be able to monitor employee and client behavior more holistically and look at behavior over time rather than just through a single point in time event like you mentioned earlier. Then going to moving on to network generation, our analytics in that space can be used to identify real world connections to an entity. So things like social connections or those less obvious or even hidden connections that are not apparent through internal data alone. And this can help to identify interesting groups. It can in, in start to identify them as they start to form. So again, as behavior changes, and that could help you, for example, find potentially collusive groups or, or interesting relationships or relationships perhaps haven't been disclosed through the proper channels. So haven't been disclosed through things like conflicts of interest registers or outside business interests. And I just want to draw out a speech from the Director of Enforcement and Oversight at the FCA uh, that was given last year, which suggests to me that regulators are also starting to adopt these types of approaches and use of data. And he said, uh, in relation to market manipulation, he said, cases are complex and more difficult to investigate than insider dealing or other types of market abuse because they're not transactional or involve opportunistic trading. And then went on to say, well, perpetrators often work in groups in an organized way and they use sophisticated techniques over extended time periods. So if you're just looking at single point in time events or events in isolation, you're going to miss the bigger picture. And I think we're seeing other regulators around the globe uh, also adopting these types of approaches. We see many more fines and enforcements for behaviors that previously the regulators struggled to detect. So things like spoofing, which evidences the significant investment that they've been making in buying or building new technology and the way they use the huge volumes of data that they have access to. And so I think it's really important that banks don't get left behind and don't get caught using outdated technology and models. And then just a few more kind of quick features on Quantex and how we help overcome some of these challenges. So firstly, I just want to mention Quantex is scalable, it can ingest extremely large volumes of data. So we have many clients that use Quantex for many different use cases and solutions. And we're ingesting billions and billions of data records as part of that. Our models are fully transparent, so auditable, explainable, can be used to kind of pass through model governance. And also, we have granular security models. And what that means, you can have role-based access. So teams within surveillance can have share access, so share information on a need-to-know basis, ensure that you're adhering to kind of global privacy laws, etc. But what it also means you can have different users in different lines of defense using the same tool, accessing the same data, but getting a different snapshot or view of it. So you can have your business supervisors in the first line or the 1.5 line of defense accessing the same data as perhaps the surveillance team are using, and even the same data that internal audit might be using to do some of their kind of investigations and assessments. And so all of these things that I've just mentioned combined is what can help users make the right decisions. Yeah. I think it's really important what you said, Ross, around um, risk weight, rate weighting as well for some of the users, because I think where, where I've seen it before, compliance teams, they just get flooded with alerts and, and they don't really know where to start because there's not there's not that priority given to them. I know that's something that the regulator has, um, you know, particularly the FCA has, has, has made a man, you know, has encouraged firms to do is to make sure that they have a risk based approach to, to their monitoring. So it's great to hear that, that Quantexa uses that. Um, just, just thinking about the, the wider ecosystem and everyone's trying to you know, move away from, from silos, how, how does Quantexa create more of a holistic or, or integrated monitoring approach? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, first off, Quantexa don't do everything. So it's absolutely essential. We do operate as part of an ecosystem if we want to help our clients be successful and, and help be part of the solution to provide holistic monitoring. And so we need to be able to integrate with the best in class solutions and data providers that do what we don't do. But we can kind of do it in such a way that allows us to create that bigger picture I mentioned, create that context, 
and join the dots, helping to kind of make our, our kind of clients more effective and efficient. And from the very outset, our platform was designed with that in mind. So uh, the context of platform is built on open source data science tools and third party solutions, allowing us to do both batch analytics, but also dynamic and near real time decisioning. And to do that, we use many of the same tools that most of the banks and clients we have are already using. So that, that's kind of a key benefit. Uh, another one is that we don't have a fixed data model. So what that means is we can take data in its native format and we do the transformation on our side. So when a bank goes through the process of extracting their data for use by a system, they don't then have to put it into a prescribed data model and do the transformation on their side. We take it as it is. And then uh, another thing I want to mention is I think we're seeing surveillance teams actually now bring in more people with data science and coding skills, which I think is only a good thing. I think surveillance teams need to have more awareness of how the technology works and the data that's being used. But I think there's also an onus on vendors to try and make things easier and simpler for our users. And so we have a tool called Data Fusion, for example, which has been designed to make it simpler and easier to load data into the system without needing any code and doing it directly via the UI. Now, I think once you kind of built the platform in, in that way, it really does allow for lots of optionality. So context could do everything. It could be the primary detection tool, but recognizing that we do want to operate as part of an ecosystem, we can also leverage the output from existing tools, as I mentioned. We can bring in the same data those tools are using, or we could just take the output. We could bring in additional data and context into context to, to be additive and supplement what's already being used in those tools. And we can then use that to provide additional analytics, applying entity resolution and network generation. And this can then be used to address coverage gaps and help improve risk detection. And to give an example of where we do, we've done that very effectively with clients, taking a behavior like wash trades. Um, so most trade surveillance tools will have the same logic, looking for the same entity, doing a buy and sell of a, a kind of security within a very short space of time, same volume, same price. Uh, but we've been able to play around with those parameters to look at things like percentage variances on the volume or the price that's been traded, to look at extended time periods between those trades, which is particularly relevant for some of the higher risk products that are more susceptible to financial crime. So things like low price securities and also using that external data, that context to identify where there's repeat patterns of behaviors between entities that are actually in fact connected. But you can only see that view by bringing in the external context. And in terms of being able to operate as part of an ecosystem, I think there's a number of key benefits to that approach. And first is it allows banks to leverage their existing investments. They can leverage the tools they have in place today. They can assess those tools over a longer period to determine which ones potentially need to be improved, which ones can be augmented and be part of that wider ecosystem to kind of give them the most effective monitoring and also potentially identify those that need replacing either in the short term or potentially over time. Um, it also helps to create efficiencies so it can automate some of the repetitive and manual tasks that investigators are currently carrying out, time spent outside of the system gathering data or information. I did a time emotion studies last uh, exercise last year where I found that 90% of the review has been done outside of the platform. If, if you have a tool that can automate part of that process and do it to a higher degree of accuracy and confidence, that's going to create efficiencies. And then also by, by operating as part of an ecosystem, bringing all of that data together and having it talk in so it's not currently sitting in silos, it opens up the use for many more proactive purposes and allows you to view that data from multiple vantage points to improve risk detection. So it means you have greater ability to do things like thematic reviews or deep dives as needed. It allows users to be able to dynamically respond much faster to market conditions and test for potential exposure to new or emerging risks. And if you find that that risk does exist within your data and your, your kind of business, that can actually then be built back into scenarios as well. Whereas if it doesn't exist, you actually have greater confidence. You don't need an unnecessary model. You don't need to put something in place unnecessarily. Um, so, so being part of an ecosystem, as I say, is absolutely essential to us in being able to help our banks be successful in finding risk. I think it's really good that your tool is able to, to do a lot of the data mapping itself for us because I think one of the blockers that banks have had for integrating with vendors previously is that they think they've got to have this <clears throat> this wonderfully cleansed data lake before that they can actually bring a system on board which which clearly isn't the case for, for Contexa. Absolutely and we often say kind of don't let the data hold you back and, and that is very reassuring. People find what they have very sticky um, but that should that absolutely shouldn't hold them back. Yeah. Um, 
And, and why do you think banks are, are, are struggling to, to do this on, on their own? And therefore, what are the benefits of, of coming to a third party vendor like yourselves? Sure. I mean, I think we've already started to touch upon some of this because, because as we mentioned, despite significant investment in new tools since the introduction of MAR in 2016, that those kind of false positives really are still a major issue and are proving to be an immovable obstacle. And what that means, is it prevents teams from doing more strategic work and going above and beyond just the BAU. Uh, and with so many resources focused on low quality outputs, this takes up a lot of time. They're unable to focus on new new projects. Uh, and I really do get the impression that banks are frustrated. They can't turn off some of these controls, even though they're not effective and aren't working very well, because they fear the repercussions from, from the regulators. And with so much cost already incurred, again, that there's not necessarily that desire in the short term to rip out and replace the tools that are being used. But whenever I speak to banks, they definitely want to be able to get more from what they've got and actually get their existing tools working better and integrated with other tools to create that holistic view. So going back to the ecosystem point, um, and I heard an interesting quote from someone at an event last year that got a lot of nods from people around the room where they said it's easier to add to surveillance rather than take away because that can actually be difficult to justify to regulators and auditors, particularly where that, that investment's only recently been made. Um, I think one of the other challenges that I'm, I'm kind of seeing at the moment is, a, in fact, probably more of a barrier, uncertainty. What can we or can't we do? With many more people now working from home or having hybrid working models, I see a lot of desire to create things like trader profiles or employee scorecards and do more around behavioural analytics. But at the moment, this is being done in a very manual way rather than systematically. And I think there's a lot of uncertainty about what data can be used to support that. There's a lot of recognition that external data can add value, but does it start to throw in some ethical considerations when you're creating things like profiles? Um, and we at Context, as I've already mentioned, we use lots of different external data sets, which we use to tackle specific risk typologies or high risk products and behaviours. And we use sources that are both reliable and explainable and have been through governance at many of our clients. So that's just one example of the type of knowledge that a vendor can bring. Uh, then, of course, there's always competition for investment budget. There's always kind of very tight purse strings. And so recently we've had things like LIBOR transition, trying to kind of get traders and staff set up from home, the, the, the cost of onboarding new communication chan channels. Um, I, I guess what I don't see is many banks trying to create what Quantex do, but I've seen attempts by banks to do things like entity matching or entity link analysis or start to play around with using network graphs, recognising you need to, to look at the wider net network and relationships. What I do see is more of a willingness though to buy proven technologies and, and even from newer and sometimes smaller vendors. I think in the past it's been very tough for, for new small vendors, but they're actually being a lot more successful now. I think larger financial institutions do want to use vendors where they need to solve a problem very quickly, but they're very worried that they need to buy something that integrates with their existing systems and architecture. So I think there's an acknowledgement that um, it's very rare that a vendor can come in and fully meet a large bank's very complex requirements. So it's important that a vendor can offer a hybrid approach that the banks can build on top and work together in partnership with that vendor. And I think partnerships are really key word. If you pick the right vendor, they're going to help you to be successful, but they're also likely to also bring in a, a community of other um, kind of clients and users that are happy with the tool and work collaboratively and come together to share ideas and help jointly tackle some of those complex challenges. Um, I heard another nice quote from someone at a bank recently and he said, we want a vendor to solve for 80% of the problem because they've done it before and they can deliver it faster, but we need the ability to build on top of that ourselves. We want to do the final 20% in-house as there'll be parts of the problem that are unique to us. And again, the context of the platform is designed in such a way to help users do that. It's completely transparent. What we do is we work with our clients to make them fully self-sufficient in being able to use the tool. So they're not reliant on us to make changes to the platform or to the models that they need so they can react very dynamically. Um, as I've already touched upon, there's a lot of investment going on at the moment to make the tool simpler for users. And, and as mentioned, this is all absolutely critical to allow banks to dynamically react to new or emerging risks very quickly. I think it's great to see that banks are changing their approach and, and starting to use newer, more innovative fintechs, because I think particularly in the surveillance world, there was a feeling before that you know, large large banks just want to use the system that their peers are using because it's had the regulator's blessing and it, and it works for you know big, big organizations with, with with difficult infrastructure so it's, um, you know it's definitely good to see um, banks adopting more innovative uh, products and solutions now for sure 
Yeah, I think you touched upon it earlier. There's definitely a move away from just being compliant and, and ticking the box towards taking a more risk-based approach. Yeah. And we, we've talked a lot so far around data and technology, but I'm also interested to see if you come across any trends in operating models for how compliance teams are actually you know, monitoring the process to, to be as efficient as a, and effective as possible? Yeah, it's a great question, but because uh, we are actually seeing a lot of kind of operator, operating model changes that are in progress or have already been made. And for me, that raises the question, kind of what comes first, the operating model change or technology change? Because for me, technology change can actually bring about the opportunity to transform the way you, things are done today and to very much be part of designing that new operating model and thinking about how things are done, who are the people that we need to use that, what's the skill set of the users, etc. And just on that point, we're actually seeing the resourcing and experience and skill set of surveillance teams start to, to shift a little bit. As more banks are using systems that are generating fewer alerts, but of higher quality and providing context, automating parts of that manual repetitive kind of super surveillance and, and investigation that affords them the ability to bring back the review from lower cost locations back closer to the business, like a higher cost region. But again, because there's fewer alerts, you can actually have potentially a more expensive uh, kind of individual review in those. And as such, we've seen a lot of firms bring in ex-traders and market practitioners, people with really strong product knowledge and who really understand the market. Yeah. And touched on earlier. Sorry, Nick, go ahead. And no, we've definitely seen that as well. I think previously looking at um, yeah, monitoring, monitoring surveillance abuse, we would have teams that were focused on trade surveillance, one team focused on comm surveillance, but now we're seeing that actually it's easier to, to align it by product so that you've got an analyst looking looking across trade and comms as well. Absolutely, and there's also, um, when I speak to traders that are now in that position, they, they say they possess something that the technology doesn't possess or, or people that are removed from the business. They say they have a good bullshit filter, which is actually pretty critical as well. You can't take away human judgment as well from the process. Yeah. Uh, and then, then finally, we've also seen sort of data, more teams bringing in data scientists, the people that can code and create models. Um, so that, that's been another shift. But in terms of other specific operating model changes that I've observed, uh, we've seen things like market abuse and surveillance teams and financial crime transaction monitoring teams starting to come together. Uh, but whilst this has been done organisationally and allows for the better sharing of data between those teams and the chance to do things like dual track investigations, still being done in quite a siloed manner using separate tools so they're not starting to create that bigger picture and join the tots just yet and in fact we often still see uh, trade surveillance teams using multiple trade surveillance tools for different assets and product classes so at the moment they don't even have a cross product view of risk yeah. um, i've seen some teams go beyond that so not just bringing together surveillance and transaction monitoring but creating what um, i've heard called central utility teams or also known as the control tower so the creation of centers of excellence with expert knowledge, bringing in controls, output and metrics from any existing control that touches upon employee or client risk. So as mentioned, not just the surveillance or the transaction monitoring, but also things like control room, fraud, um, conduct, unauthorized trading, uh, cyber risk, etc. And then finally, we've also still seen quite a lot of shift the movement between lines of defence. So a lot of movement into the first line or that 1.5 line of defence with them picking up more of the monitoring role and the second line acting more in an advisory and assurance capacity rather than doing all of the monitoring. I think to me what's clear, Nick, is that whatever the organisational changes, they must be supported by process and technology improvements to allow for better data sharing and risk detection uh, for, for the organisation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I would, I would echo your, your thoughts on that. We've not really seen market abuse and financial crime monitoring being done in much of an integrated way, be it from a process or, or a technology area. And I think you know, we'll hopefully we'll start to see that over the next coming years because the regulator has suggested that, that that is something that should start to happen. I think it's really important because what we see from the stats when it comes to stores and SARS is they're often misclassified or sometimes they both should actually be submitted because the kind of overlaps between financial crime and market manipulation. And so as you start to bring those teams together, you get better at doing that. But technology can actually play a part in helping to do that even more effectively. Yeah, definitely. And with um, with the world we've lived in now for, for 18 months uh, during the pandemic, you know, compliance teams of anxiety has grown uh, in, in the working from home model. Um, 
how have you noticed that COVID impacting you know banks' appetite to to bring in more more investment into surveillance? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it, this is a topic I talk about a lot right now with with our clients, with our prospects, with other market participants and our partners, of course. Um, and it's interesting because historically, of course, most technology change has been driven by regulation or a need to reduce headcount and cost. Uh, and those drivers absolutely haven't gone away. But it's been interesting to see we've all had to adapt very quickly in the current environment to ensure that we can still effectively supervise and monitor employees. And as we've kind of gone through that process, I think in some cases it's meant that when we've assessed the previous ways of doing things, we found they don't work as well as perhaps we would like or we thought they did, or they simply don't work at all. And I think when COVID kicked in, banks had to act very fast to set employees up from home. And uh, regulators actually helped with that in some ways by providing some relief. So things like relaxing voice recording rules for a period of time, enabling the banks to kind of do this quickly without fall, the fear of falling foul to the regulators. But things were done kind of quite tactically. And like we're communicating now on Teams and video, almost overnight the way the bank staff had to kind of communicate changed and they shifted towards communication channels that had previously been unauthorised and weren't being monitored. But this is now the new normal. So with the relief over and staff starting to return to the office, and in fact, many traders are already in the office, there's question marks about whether those channels should now be turned off again, or whether they should be accepted because they are the new normal and therefore need to be onboarded onto to, to the uh, surveillance channels. Uh, and another point to kind of regularly discuss with, with industry participants, I know it's a very hot topic for, for example, the FIC Market Standards Board at the moment is, kind of how do you, you monitor in, in this remote working environment because um, in my view the primary control for monitoring employees and the, in fact the main deterrent is being able to see them in person each day, being able to spot unusual behaviour, being able to ask questions, being able to take action quickly. If you then remove that there's much greater reliance on critical technology, uh, the data that feeds the systems that are being used, the model effectiveness and the output that's being generated and the way it can be viewed and used by users. And it's been really interesting recently that um, we've had a lot of discussions around unauthorised trading monitoring. Um, a lot of the technology and controls that's being used was put in place kind of over 10 years ago, which was around the time of the last well publicised rogue trader. Yet without new cases on which to train the models, we're left with a lot of out of date models and old controls that have had a lot of sticky plasters on over the years. And I think what's important to note is that a lot of these controls weren't necessarily designed to detect rogue traders. But I think the reality is that they don't exist in many organisations, certainly not to, to a very large scale, but they were designed to help set the right guardrails for employees. So the question for me now becomes, are those guardrails in the right places and ensuring the right behaviour? Like how does the employee know when to stop and where the line is and is that line in the right place? And what I'm sensing is that there is a growing fear that real risk might be risked if you continue to use some of these models in the current environment. And so, for a more holistic view, you need to be able to monitor employees effectively both when they're in the office and when they're out of the office. And as work-life patterns evolve, it's important to keep on top of these changes and be able to identify the suspicious changes versus the more acceptable lifestyle changes, such as checking emails earlier or later in the day. And so the technology can really help to identify the subtle and connected events or changes in behaviour that, that happen over time. Because as we've already touched upon, many of the controls are done in a vacuum. They do only look at a single point in time event and apply a rule. So they look at a trade or they look at a communication, but they fail to recognise the context of the, the who, the what, the why and the relationships, etc. And Quantex are now starting to take some of our clients on the journey where we've been very successful for, for one implementation and using that same data, flipping the focal entities or flipping the use case, but also bringing in the additional data that's required as part of that use case and extending it out so more control and surveillance teams can use it. Uh, and one final point I wanted to mention, because I think it's worth highlighting that, that the same tools and data that's being used today to detect risk and poor conduct sh should, in my opinion, also be in being used to detect good conduct and performance. And this should be an, an area where banks are willing to invest. And, and for me, that can actually only be a really good outcome for employees. Um, so just going back to your question, yes, definitely. There's definitely an appetite to improve the tools that are being used today and the models, but also invest where required to protect not only the bank, but to help protect employees and the clients too. Yeah, no, thanks a lot, Ross. And yeah, I think it's going to be really interesting to see over the next year or two, how many cases of insider dealing come up where banks have you know, found it difficult to protect the dissemination of a lot of their non-public information with, with employees being at home. So we're definitely going to keep, keep, keep watching this space. But... Look, Ross, um, 
thanks very much for, for joining us today. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Um, I'm sure our listeners would, will too. Um, please do join us for our future leadership dialogue sessions where we think about reimagining financial services in the future. And uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you all soon. Thanks a lot, Ross. Very much. Cheers, Nick. Thank you.